So, I'm glad you guys are here this morning. Let's talk about the scriptures for a second. If you pull out your handouts, you're going to see that the title of our conversation this morning is called The Enemy. Now, when it comes to the enemy of the family, I cannot help it but be reminded of the article that I found online from the Wall Street. The Wall Street, which is one of the most influential newspapers across our nation and the world, had an article that was entitled with the title, What's the Most Macho Name in Movies? What's the most macho name in movies? In other words, what's the name that is used the most that reflects the macho attitude, macho view? So let's let's talk about it for a second, okay? Because I got I got a couple of pictures for you. The movie is Commander. Back in the eighties, some of you weren't even born, but if you remember the name for the commander is John Matrix. Now this is the original Matrix. All right, this is before the Matrix. All right, here we go. Now here's Mr. Matrix. Back in the day, also in the eighties, and he came up with this movie where his name was John Newton. Then, who could ever forget? Terminator 2, and the character's name is John Connor, right? Here we go. Then, Kindergarten Cup, again. The governor came back with the name of John Kimball. Now, look at me. I am not in any way shape and form endorsing these movies. Do not leave this place saying, oh, pastor said that we're going to, no. I'm not trying to watch any of these movies because of a bunch of violence and language issues and no. All, I'm trying to get a point across your brain this morning. So stay put. Don't leave, okay? Then your razor came into the place where, again, Mr. Governor was John Kruger. Now remember, the article from the Wall Street is what's the most macho name in movies. So you're getting the picture, right? How can you go into the macho category without Mr. Bruce Willis and uh, Die Hard? His name was? John McClane. Come on, yeah, yeah, I knew. Yes, sir, back in the 80s, I was in middle school. And you got Mr. John Rambo. Yes, he was young. If you're smiling, I ju you just dated yourself. You just dated yourself, Mr. John Shaft, right? And then the militia man came around with Mr. Spartan, John Spartan. And then the most, most recent movie, again with the governor, is John Wharton. And this is the one movie that people are expecting to draw billions of dollars. Obviously, it's one of the movies that is about to come into the Two theaters by with the title of the name by John Wick. Again, Kenya Reeves into the deep. Now, here's why I'm bringing this movie before you this morning. I don't want you to watch it. I just want to get a point across across you this morning. Um, when we began the series, I explained to you the difference between function and essence. It is on your handout, so you have to fill this out. And what I explained to you is when God created men and women. He created them with a worldview, and the Bible was written in a context where this was this was a counterculture statement. Here's what I'm planning with this. When the Bible was written, it was written to men and women, a society where there was the value of chickens, the worth of maybe cattle, and then right above cattle and animals, it was women and children. So last week, we spent time talking about how Jesus blessed the children, and it was a revolutionary thought. So when you look at Paul in Ephesians, after he goes into this whole deal of submission, he basically concludes at the end of chapter, uh, at, the, at the end of chapter five, beginning of chapter six of Ephesians, and he says, he says this. He says, wives, you have to submit to your husbands. And then here's the crazy thing that I believe: people in the synagogues, people in the church houses, the word again, the word reading these letters from, or these writings from Paul from prison just went ballistic. And he says, husbands, love your wives. Now, why is this crazy? This is the reason why this is counterculture. Because in this time in history, as a man, as a husband, you only love concubines. You never love your 
wives. In your wives, again, women only find their worth value based on the family that they came from, so your father or the husband that you're married to, the man. Okay, so what we explain from day one is that the scripture is written in a context where even though we are different in function, we are the same in essence. So when it comes to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, Jesus died for everyone. But when it comes to the structure of the family, when it comes to the structure of society, when it comes to the structure of the church, there are differences for the sake of functionality. So when you look at this whole thing of function and essence, by default, you and I know that if, okay, let me put it to you this way. We are five of my family, so we're the same in essence. But we have a sixth member of the family, and his name is Chuchu. <laughs> now, here's the thing about family life. Chucho has been with us for almost five years. He was, he's the sixth member of the family. Um, on Tuesday, we, we, we have a two-story house, and Chucho is trained where he's only allowed to the first floor. He's not allowed to go into the stairs and go to the second floor. Multiple reasons. Um, carpet, upstairs. Bedrooms upstairs, uh, we just don't, he's not allowed. He, he knows that he's supposed to stay down, and he does a pretty good job on that. He's trained, party trained, so he goes, you know, outside and this whole thing. But at night, every single night, we tie up this chucho thing. And we get his leash, and he sleeps tied up. Because we just want to take any chances with the bathroom deal. I don't want to be cleaning in the morning, especially, you know, morning rush, kids, school, it's crazy. So. On Tuesday, I forgot to tie up this crazy dog. 2.45 in the morning. And he is barking his dogs out. Like, he is going crazy, barking crazy. You, this morning, will have a problem if at 2.45 in the morning, I elbow my beautiful wife and said, hey, Check it out. Maybe somebody broke into the house. <laughs> You'll have a problem with that. Because by nature, by instinct, you know that we men are supposed to be protectors. We're supposed to always rescue the girl. The girl always goes home while the guy can potentially die, right? <laughs> that, that, I mean, you, you love movies when the guy sacrifices for the girl. So when you look at the list of these macho men throughout Hollywood, it's no brainer. I mean, this is how, this is a, a resemblance of function in essence. Because you will have a problem if I just roll over my bed and cover myself and say, let me know how that goes, sweetheart. Go and check it out. Because it sounded like somebody broke into the house. That's how it sounded. But what happened is, because he, he's looking through the window and two cats were passing by. So he went crazy with the cats outside the window. But typically if he's tied up, he will notice the, the cats. So, so this morning, what I want you to think about it is, is this essence of, this, this deal of, essence and function because <clears throat> what is happening is that if man, if man, if we are protectors, if we are defenders, if we are home safety keepers, I hope that that's the case for you man, for me also, um, here's the issue, this is what we're going for the next few minutes. The issue for me is not that we are, except in Hollywood just keeps on portraying that and reminds us that we are supposed to be protectors. Um, I think the issue is that because of our moral compacts, because of this sexual revolution that is crazy going on around, because we are upside down, we have forsaken, we have forgotten who the enemy is. So the fact that you're a protector, I don't think that's a question. I think you know you're a protector, man. But the problem is that who are you protecting from? Who's the enemy? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, here's what the Bible says. Handouts. The first thing that, there are two things basically I'm going to start to talk to you today. The first one is that the world is your enemy. The world is the enemy of the family. The world is against family. How do I know this? Listen to the words of Jesus on John chapter 15, verses 8 and 18 and 19. If the world, now he's talking to disciples, but it obviously covers family. If the world, or let me put it this way, since the world hates you, keep in mind that it is the world who has also hated me first. In other words, keep in mind that when it comes to kingdom work, you and I, we are in sales, he is in management. I hope that that made any sense to you. 
right now. We are in sales, he is in management. He owns the business. We're just, we're just working for the king. Listen to verse 19. If you belong to the world, it, it would love you as its own. That's a sign that you belong, that you don't have any problem with what's going on in the world. But since you are not of the world, you do not belong to the world, but you have chosen, I have chosen you out of the world. See the word church, the word ecclesia means the separate ones, the put apart ones, that's us. The Bible says, that is why the world hates you. So once again, number one, the world hates your family. Let's define what the word world means. It's a simple statement because I don't want to be, I don't want for it to have any confusion. The word world basically means anyone or anything that is against God or has become an enemy of God. What that implies is that Anything that God created is good. Man has the ability, unfortunately, to take something good and beautiful and make it supreme, make it ultimate. So let me just ask you this question. Is marriage good? Yes, it is. Can you make an idol out of marriage? Yes, you can. Is money good? Money. Money good? It is good. Can you potentially become an idol? Do you worship that? Yes, we can. What about sex? I don't know. Sex is really good. <laughs> don't look at me that fucking okay, arrow. <laughs> it can potentially become detrimental if you make if you make it supreme or ultimate. So anything that you take that God created, which is basically everything. Right? Relationship, parenting, dating, emotions. If you take it and make it supreme and you make it ultimate, that's the world. That's an enemy of God's nature. So Jesus is coming and saying, hey, because those things will hate you. In other words, those things that you are making supreme, those things that are become evil, that they were good by nature, ultimately they are enemies of God. And when you do that, listen to this, that's when you worship them. So. Jesus says, here's the antidote. This is how you avoid taking the goodness of God, the goodness of creation, the goodness of relationship, the goodness of the things that God has given you to be stewards, obviously, and to avoid to make Him supreme or ultimate. Here's what He says. He says, we just read in, verses, in the verse 18 and 19, He says, keep in mind. Here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus uses the language of keeping in mind, he's basically implying no. No. Be conscious. Be alert. Be aware. Know what you're dealing with. In this case, what I want you to understand is that this worship, this idolatry, this ultimate thing that we created, the antidote is not for us to be friends with the world. The antidote is not for the world to change its patterns, although the world needs to change its patterns. The antidote is not for us to have like a kumbaya, you know, we're all brothers and we just like each other. That's not the antidote. The antidote is for you to know the scriptures. And I'm going to tell you why you got to know the scriptures. Because many times as Christians, we're so arrogant that we pray for God to change our government, for Him to change organized crime, for Him to change divorce, for Him to change whatever it is that needs to be changed. And we need to pray for those things. But you know what the Bible does when you embrace the Bible? It changes. It changes you. And in other words, here's what I want you to know. As a communicator of the scriptures, I have no right to approach this book and say, well, I'm going to preach on Sunday, so I got to tell you what the Bible is this, so I can tell you. No. What happens is when you approach this book, this book is in German. If you don't examine the Bible, the Bible examines you. The Bible is the one that actually just penetrates into areas that Jesus says, the way you're going to deal with this crazy, crazy society, crazy economy, crazy relationships, crazy whatever it is, the, the, the way you're going to deal with, with all these things that are constantly shaping our culture is not by staying away from them. It's not by simply hating on them or hating back on them. How do you do this? You've got to train yourself in the scriptures. 
This is why we're adamant to constantly invite you to come back and join the journey of learning the scriptures together. And here is how he kind of evaluates whether this is happening or not. Now, again, I don't have time to go into details on these things, but here is what has happened. And I'm hoping that you are not in this category. Somewhere in the mix, somewhere in the process, we made the Bible a knowledge-driven experience. And among Baptists, if you're not a Baptist, or you're checking out Baptist churches, I want to hear this. Unfortunately, with Baptists, and I say unfortunately, because I want, I want to draw a very, kind of a clear line in here. Sometimes we are very driven by doctrine, which I'm not against doctrine. I think doctrine is necessary, but we forget that in the scriptures, doctrine impacts behavior. Doctrine shapes ethics, ethical conduct, who you are, how you treat one another. And I'm bringing this up because when the Bible says, I need you to know that the world is going to hate you. I need you to know that the way you're going to counterattack this hate is by knowing the Bible. Not by hating back, not by being isolated, not by putting yourself above others. You need to understand this, is that when you belong to Jesus, see, 